Lord, as we come to your word, uh, Lord, we come humbly. We come in fear and trembling, Lord. These are the very words of God who made everything with these very same words. And Lord, we ask that you will give us your message today, Lord, that you will open up these scriptures, shine your light upon these truths, Lord. Give us the spirit of wisdom, revelation, understanding into these scriptures. Not that we may just get more knowledge, Lord, for the sake of more knowledge, Lord, but Lord, we can get more knowledge so we can become more like Jesus, so we can understand more who you are, that we can love you more and love others better. Lord, please help us now in Jesus' name. Okay, that seems like it's been ages since I've been been here which about a, about a month or so yeah so um sorry I'm back and uh yeah in Genesis 2 so just um we've in Genesis 1 we've got almost like a a big picture look at the creation week and how God acted uh, in Genesis 2 we have a replay of some of those events but it's not in a chronological order it's uh it's more in a themed order I heard one Bible teacher put it like this um, when you get like a manual on how to build a house or I don't know if there are manuals on how to build a house but but if you did you would find they would be in sections carpentry and rendering and you know the different sections of the different trades um, and the, it wouldn't but you couldn't put the house together like that you couldn't just do all the carpentry then all the electrical work and you know all the uh, plumbing you've got to it's all got to work in together so what we have here is if you look at it on the surface you'd say oh this looks like a bit of a different order to what we see in the first chapter of Genesis and yet it it's not actually describing an order it's more in themes it's trying to God's trying to teach us something in Genesis 2 uh, another Bible teacher I listened to said it's like in Genesis 1 you're looking at a big map but you know how you can sort of like you get those maps that are like a full map and then you can get a zoomed in map of, of a certain section and that's kind of what it's like here we've had this big picture the the heavens the earth uh, the sun it's almost like we're in heaven with God and he's describing all the things that he made but now we seem to be on the earth and we're looking at it from a different perspective so um, so yeah it's a it's sort of a zoomed in look uh, in of the creation week and certain parts of it specifically the creation of man and woman um, man uh, man in this in this passage in in this chapter it, we see him placed in relationship to God, woman, and beast. Uh, we see, a, see, God straight away from the outset um, puts man into relationships, right? Our relationship to God is one of obedience. Our relationship to animals is one of dominion, and the earth as well is one of dominion. And relationship to each other is, uh, is a, um, a companion relationship, right? So man and woman, companion. And I believe that God puts man right in the beginning chapters into these relationships because love is only possible in relationship. One of the great arguments for the Trinity is that if God is love and love can really only be expressed with another, then God could have been loved from all eternity because Father, Son and Holy Spirit in perfect love. But now we see man in, in the sort of a, a trinity, I guess, of relationships here with his father uh, to obey and there's already um, things that Adam's told he can and can't do uh, then we see him naming the animals right it, when you name something it's because you have authority over that right so I can name my children but I can't name your children or as one Bible teacher said I can but behind your back <laughs> right? um, so this naming is a is a signal of authority over or dominion over and we see that here the three aspects of man in creation, in being created, and what we see in the Garden of Eden, um, there's three aspects to, our, to all our relationships. Um, man has three core needs, security, self-worth, and significance. Significance we find in what we do. Uh, self-worth is who we are before God. And security is often found in relationships, mutually beneficial relationships. So God has already created the relationships in which we can have significance our work you know like um, Adam was given the animals but also the land and the garden to, to look after he had a relationship with his father which said who he was and a relationship uh, with a woman um, where security could be brought in and when we look in Genesis 3 we can see those three areas are actually targeted at the uh, at the when the forbidden fruit was taken so I just wanted to sort of you know briefly mention that that now before we 
we go there next week. So that's this is what we're looking at now. We're sort of zooming in and we're there's some wonderful truths here and we just get a, a closer picture of what's actually happening on the earth at this time. Thus, says, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So God didn't rest because he was tired, right? God doesn't get tired. But God rested in the sense that as a full stop, that the work had been completed. The work was done in six days and then he rested. God did not institute the Sabbath as law here yet, but established the one day in seven as a rest day, as a principle. Right? So right from the creation week, we have the Sabbath and people resting on the Sabbath. Um, before the law was given, the children of Israel had a, um, practiced a Sabbath in a sense, right? If you look at the children when they came out of Egypt, the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they were fed manna. On the sixth day, they had to collect enough for the seventh day so they couldn't do work. Did you realize that scripture is before the law is given, before the Sabbath is given? Sometimes when you read scriptures in isolation, you don't see the chronological order. We see God resting, we see the children of Israel resting, and the law isn't yet given. In the millennium too, in the millennial reign of Christ, we see the Sabbath is reinstated. Isn't that an interesting thought? The, the Sabbath is practiced in the millennium. You know, a whole lot of stuff's going to go down here. We're going to be raptured out of that. Then we're coming back to reign with Jesus for a thousand years on the earth. Right before the eternal state's realized at the end of that time and Satan's finally cast into the lake of fire. But in that time, the Sabbath is and the sacrifices are reinstated. So isn't that fascinating? So in some ways, the principle of the Sabbath is almost an eternal principle. It, it at least originates well before the law and, and we see it post the law in, in, uh, in the millennial reign. So that might cause us to ask the question, should we practice the Sabbath? Whatever that means. <clears throat> but what we've got to realize is the Sabbath is actually part of the ceremonial law, not moral. And here's why. Or else it would have been wrong for it not to be practiced before the law was given. Also, the Gentiles would have had a conscience about it if it was evil to not rest on it. So we've got a sort of, there's two extremes in here. People that reject any notion of a Sabbath, they, they may try to switch it to a Sunday or, or make it a particular day. And then we have those who, uh, who start pract like become almost Jewish in their practice of it. And they don't do anything between, you know, sunset on Friday and, and sun, you know, what is it? sunset the next day on Saturday afternoon because their days go from the, as soon as the sun sets. So, but we've got to realize that they're, it's not. It's the only one of the Ten Commandments that actually has is part of the ceremonial law, and and look how it's not. The parts of the law that are, and I think I've shared this with most of you guys before, but look, you can look at the law of God um, into three basic categories: civic or national law, ceremonial law, and moral law. Moral law, God never changed his mind about what was right or wrong. If it's evil and wicked in itself to not practice a Sabbath, then all the way back at the beginning of creation, it would have been evil and wicked and people would have been storing up wrath even before the law, right? So there are parts of the law that are ceremonial. That doesn't mean they're not to be followed. In fact, the, the, the punishment, does anyone know the punishment for not practicing the Sabbath, for not resting on the Sabbath? Does anyone know? I didn't know you're stoned. So yeah, separated permanently from your, from the people. Yeah, so if you profane the Sabbath. So it became very serious because it's about obedience. Once it became part of the law, then it needed to be followed and there were severe consequences for not. Yet in and of itself, ceremonial law is not, it doesn't have a wicked or a moral component to it, right? Not eating shellfish like the Israelites. Now that doesn't have a, a wicked component to it. It's not evil. You don't eat shellfish and go, ooh, I'm feeling really, you know, um, I've just sinned against the Lord. You know, you don't come to the Lord and start confessing your sins of, of not eating kosher food. It's these parts of the ceremonial law. But you do always, if, if you've murdered, hopefully not, even hated, um, looked with lust, stolen, lied, we have a conscience of these things. 
and even the, the unbeliever has a conscience of those things. We know because when we go out on Friday nights and other times, we notice that the, the conscience is working quite strongly on those things, but we never had anyone sort of come to us in tears convicted over eating shellfish the day before. Right? So there, we have these differing laws. But again, you, we've got to realize here that um, this doesn't mean the ceremonial law has gone away. Just like the Sabbath hasn't, and in fact, it's reinstituted in the millennial reign as well. But it's the principle behind it is still there. You see, the, the ceremonial law it had a number of functions. One, one part of it is, in, is amazing. A Jewish guy wrote a book on um, how the laws protected the children of Israel and made them a blessed nation physically. Why? Because they practiced things like quarantine, not going near the dead. They had to wash with certain fats and whatnot. That was fats and charcoal. That's a soap we know today. So they were given these divine instructions. Don't eat this, don't eat that animal. We know pigs, uh, you know, high in bacteria. Whereas other animals, um, like lamb, a lot lower, right? Because of what the pig ingests and what it eats. So these laws have a natural, had a natural protection that meant the children of Israel prospered and were blessed and diseases didn't spread and they, you know, and uh, bacteria didn't spread. All these, all these um, things that God put in all the laws that he put in there was a natural component of blessing and protection there but there also is a the ceremonial laws also point to something they're shadows of something that is now real once jesus has has, has come right so when we we don't i didn't get up here and kill a lamb and, right i didn't sprinkle anyone in blood today but i kind of did in the sense that we acknowledge the death of jesus the lamb of god didn't we in prayer so i didn't do away with that but Jesus is now that perpetual living lamb, right? It's like, it's like these ceremonial laws are pictures or photographs of something, but now we've got the real thing, right? These are, so you, do you need the photographs anymore? Do you need the pictures anymore when you've got the real living thing, right? If someone's spouse is away for a long time and you've got the photos, that's great. There's nothing wrong with them. And when that person comes back, you can still have those photographs. But now you've got the real thing. Can you see how irrelevant they become? Right? So these ceremonial laws are to teach us uh, a true spiritual truths which we can now embrace. So to say all that, this principle of, of resting a day a week, I think it's a godly principle. I think it's something that we need to look at um, in our own lives. But I don't feel that we, you know, we are under the law. So I just wanted to make that little sidetrack there because this is the first institution of the Sabbath that we see, uh, not as a law, but as a principle. Verse 4, he says, this is the history, or another translation says the genealogies. This is the history or genealogies of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So that phrase, the history of the heavens, it's like God has given us, he loves genealogies and we see them all throughout scripture. He gives us the history, right? Because it, it roots us in our origin. Um, but we've just been given in Genesis 1, the history of the heavens, how, how God made the, the sun and the moon and the stars and light and how he made everything in the earth. He, uh, he, he, uses this, he uses the title for himself here, the Lord God. Did you notice that's the first time the Lord God is used? That word Lord is Yahweh. Right? So that's the Jewish name for God you would insert, insert in there. Um, some say it's Jehovah, some say Yahweh. Um, in, the, in the day that the Lord God, so Yahweh, made the earth and the heavens. So Lord God is only now used, why? Because now man's created. Beforehand, he refers to himself as Elohim. So he's divine, he talks about his divinity, but now he uses the title Lord God. Elohim is for creator, but Yahweh is talking about a covenant relationship to God. So again, man's created, in creation, we were already put in covenant relationship with God. There were obligations and blessings right from the beginning. We were not created outside of covenant with God. Isn't that incredible? But we were, as we were formed physically, the breath of life was breathed into us. We were also at that, at that same time, automatically in a covenant with God. We don't see any covenant being made like we do when Abraham makes a covenant and others make covenants, but there is an Adamic covenant, 
Um, we see it here and we see it in the title of Lord God. That's a personal, personal name for God. Um, this bit here where it's talking about there was no rain on the earth. See, on day three, when the dry land appeared, remember day three, that's when he separates the land from the, from the, dry, the water from the dry land. Um, so on day three, when the dry land appeared, but before the vegetation had sprung up the earth, uh, had sprung up on the earth, it was watered with a mist. And possibly rain, it, it didn't rain until Noah's day. So it's possible that no one had seen rain before the floods. Do you imagine that? And, and what kind of faith did Noah have to be building a boat before it ever rained, saying it's going to, you know, they haven't, you know, I don't know what God said exactly to him, like we get a summary, but, you know, did he say the, the skies are going to open up and those white things you see floating around there, they're actually going to pour water, you know? How did God explain that to him? You know, if you had, what kind of faith did Noah have? 120 years building a boat, never seen rain. Now that's, in, that's incredible. Verse 7, and the, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So man was made from the dust. Um, the word Adam means ground or, or can mean red, so like clay almost. Um, so man was made from the dust, um, from the earth, formed by God. Isn't it interesting that the minerals in our body... Scientists found they're all the same as the ones in the earth. So then, you know, of course that's true. But science always has these little revelations. And then we're like, yeah, it was in Genesis for 6,000 6, years ago. So, and there's more. And the, more and the more and more we find, the more and more science confirms the scriptures. We don't need it to. Because if it, if it doesn't, then, um, then science is wrong and they'll get it right eventually. right? But it's, so, it's quite amazing when you look into this. Um, the minerals in our bodies are the same as those that are in the earth. Um, God breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. This is like God giving man the kiss of life, literally. And we have all stories and fairy tales about people giving the breath of life and coming back to life, right? The kiss of life, sorry. But God intimately, he could have done it anyway, couldn't he? But he gets up close and he breathes into the nostrils. Does that make you think about your nostrils differently? That's where your life came. Didn't, he didn't breathe into your mouth. He breathed into your nostrils. He didn't just touch. He didn't just command. God himself with his own breath. What is that? What's God's breath like? Right? He breathes into the nostrils and, um, and man became a living being from God's breath. Our life, our soul, our spirit was breathed into us. Our outward form was made from the dust and from the dirt. And it was formed by God. But then his breath um, blew into us. And our soul and spirit was created. And then that must have had the ability to then be recreated in offspring too. Isn't that incredible? God's breath breathed into us once. He doesn't have to do it every time. And then from then on, he still forms us. He knits us together in our mother's womb, the Bible says. But if somehow that breath of life that was in Adam, is, 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 he didn't breathe twice, right? It's that same breath that somehow gets passed down from offspring to offspring. So we are, our life is is the breath of God in us. Isn't that incredible? We have the breath of God. We're made for God. You know, we're made and stamped with his image. It's a powerful thought, you know. It's a very intimate thought of God breathing his breath into us and making us alive. In verse 8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. So there's a place called Eden. Then you've got the Garden of Eden. So if Eden's here, north, east, south, west, so... Then the Garden of Eden, maybe I'll this way. So you've got Eden, and then to the right of it is the Garden of Eden. Right? So some people say, oh, no, this is all just mystical language, and it's all, you know, uh, it's just a story to tell us, because you know, they want to include things like millions of years and evolution and try and mix it all together. But how can you when you've got, you know, oh, you've got the Eden, and then to the east of Eden, you've got this, and then it names rivers that we still got today. <laughs> like it is so clear, it's a historical and geological account, uh, even though it is a theological account as well. So in the garden, there he put the man whom he had formed. <laughs> so uh, I was kind of just trying to picture that, you know, he put the man, what did he do? So he created him somewhere in Eden, and then he just picked him up. <laughs> or did he just appear there? 
right? Because this is real. I think it helps to try to get it in our mind. What, how did God do this creation stuff? Um, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Do you notice animals don't care if the flowers look pretty, do they? They just care about the good for food part. Right? But God created them. And, and he says first, pleasant to the sight. And then second, and good for food. Right? There's something aesthetic about us. Those who say we evolved from the animals, animals don't have court systems or consciences. They don't set up judges and rulers and they don't appreciate a lovely picture. You don't see the monkeys hang up a little picture on the wall that they did or that their child did, <laughs> right? Because aestheticism is a characteristic of God, of the divine, and his breath was breathed into us and his image was stamped upon us. And so in many ways, we are... You know, we are, I don't want to say we are like God because that sounds a bit heretical, but we have these characteristics because God gave them to us in his likeness and image we were made. And so we have these kind of attributes. And we, do you ever think, why do we have, why do we like beauty? And how can we tell if something's beautiful? And, how, and I can't really, I could say that, no, look, that's beautiful. And Jason go, that speaker's not beautiful. Well, who's right? Now, we know truth's not relative, but isn't it interesting? What do they say? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. What is this thing? What is this attribute of beauty? And how could it ever come about unless it was gifted to us by God? How could we ever evolve something like this? How does it help us in, a, in an evolutionary sense? It doesn't. It, but God created the plants for pleasure of sight and also good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So like I said, the Garden of Eden was east of Eden, near the Euphrates, which we'll learn later, and the Tigris. It uses a different word in the King James, but it's the Tigris rivers, which we know where they are today. This is in the region of Mesopotamia, right, near Israel. So the cradle of life was there. Life began there. Adam and Eve and their descendants, that's where the cradle of life was. Guess where secular scientists now believe the cradle of life on earth is, began? from their research, Mesopotamia, right? Yeah, there's that, that old, uh, I don't know who said it, but that story of, um, you know, man climbing the mountains, the mountain of knowledge, you know, the secular scientists climbing this mountain of knowledge. And when they finally reach over to the peak of knowledge and truth, the theologians have all been sitting there waiting for them, right? <laughs> the things that we know because we've got a testimony of how things work, how the earth was formed, how we're from the dust, where life started, all these truths and these facts. Eventually, you know, they start getting un uncovered. As astronomers look into the stars, as archeologists dig into the past. Um, yeah, as, as um, scientists start doing their work, they're really just uncovering what we know to be true anyway, that was revealed by God. Uh, one of the fathers of, um, of modern science, the father of oceanography, he found that there were pathways or channels in the deep because when he read the Bible, the Bible says that there are pathways, you made pathways and channels in the deep. And he, he went looking for them and he found them and he's the father of oceanography now. And so the Bible, some, some try to say, oh, keep the Bible out of, and religion out of science. And, you know, but the fact is that 80% of the fathers of the different modern sciences were Christians. Newton was a Christian. Um, Albert Einstein, he wasn't an atheist, he put, and he got angry when people called him one. Now, he wasn't a Christian, but it's people who have understood that there is a mind behind everything that actually realise there must be certain laws and logic. If everything is random and chaotic and evolved, then why should things make sense? You know, why, why should there be any order? Why, sh why would the laws um, be repeatable and observable? Because they would have just, you know, evolved. So. So far from it, um, again, the Bible's got it right, hey? 6,000 years ago, the cradle of, cradle of life began in Mesopotamia. Um, so here we have the introduction of the tree of life and we do see the tree of life and, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter three, um, but it's introduced here. Think about this, the tree of life would extend man's life indefinitely. But what that means is that man may not have been eternal before the fall. Now, it doesn't mean that God wouldn't have continually preserved them or let them eat of that tree. But remember they, remember they weren't allowed to eat that tree. 
right? After they had eaten from the tree of um, the knowledge of good and evil, they weren't allowed to um, eat of the tree of life anymore. And God put an angel, yep, he put an angel there to guard it. Um, maybe not just from man though. Maybe he put a, a, a mighty cherub angel there to defend so the, so the serpent or so the, the unseen realm couldn't eat of it. Who knows? Um, but that's, that's speculation. The interesting thing about this tree, um, the tree appears again in the book of Revelation in the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ. Um, and this is because what was lost in Eden is restored in the millennium and may in fact be the very reason for the millennium. Have you ever thought, why is there this 1,000 year period that happens? Like often we sort of skip that, don't we? We die, we'll go to be in heaven, we'll be in heaven forever. Well, that's not actually what happens, right? So we die. We go to be with the Lord, but the Lord comes back with us if we've died. <laughs> if we've been raptured, th then we're, we're taken, but then we return with Christ. Christ comes back with, with us and he sets up a, a kingdom on this planet. Did you know that? There's a, a th when, when the rapture happens, that's not the be all and end all. There's a thousand year reign, a thousand year of earth, of governments, places like Egypt, like th this is what the Bible says. We've got a thousand years to look forward to. In fact, that's what Hitler was trying to create. That's what the Third Reich was. Right? It was a third reign. And he was trying to establish himself and, and, and through um, stuff he was doing with genetics, a pure race that could rule the world in a utopian thousand year reign. That's what he was trying to do. So when man tries to do it, look how wicked and botched it becomes. But Jesus can do it and he'll do it. He'll do it finally. But what happened in Eden, what was lost in Eden, see, God never loses anything. He eventually, he, everything gets restored. So I believe the millennial reign, we need the millennial reign in order for God to not have lost in the Garden of Eden at the fall. God had an original plan in the Garden of Eden. And I believe that is ultimately realized in the millennial reign. We have a garden in the book of Genesis. We have a city called the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. And it's striking how many comparisons, um, when you look at the two, just how similar the Garden of Eden is to this millennial rain period. And I'll, I'll give you a couple. Um, that there's, it, we're vegetarian again. I'm sorry, guys, but we're vegetarian again in the book of, um, in the book of Revelation. And we eat fruit. And uh, the lion lays down with the lamb. It says, uh, we live long. It says that it would be a tragedy for a man to only live to a hundred. So you'd imagine if a baby's born at the beginning of the millennium, they probably live a thousand years to the end. That's so life is extended. And we know that Adam and Eve, before death came in, they could have lived for, an, you know, for a very long time. Um, God was present in the garden as the creator and is present in New Jerusalem as the redeeming and life imparting lamb, God. Man was created in God's image in Genesis and is one with God in life in the book of Revelation. Uh, redemption is portrayed in the garden. Completed redemption is seen in the city. God and man, although speaking face to face in the garden, were separate. In the New Testament, including the New Jerusalem, God in Christ lives in his believers and they live in him. And Christ will reign again. He'll walk, will, he'll walk amongst us. He'll have a throne in Jerusalem. You'll be able to physically meet and talk to Jesus. He'll be your boss, right? In the new millennium, he gives authority to his servants to various things, uh, for various tasks, and we will know him, we will meet him, we will speak to him as, a, as our boss, as our employer. The tree of life is in both the garden and the city. Jesus Christ is a reality of this tree and is available to us now as well. Um, as a choice between life and death is shown by the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge in the garden. Um, and man faces this choice through the Bible, although not in the new creation. Uh, the river of life is in both the garden and the city. Um, three kinds of precious metals were in the garden, and we'll see that in the next couple of verses, and three kinds of precious metals uh, built together in the city. Eve, the bride of Adam, who came out of Adam, is a picture of the church and New Jerusalem coming out of Christ and returning to him as his bride. God's building of the word used of Eve when she's created from the rib is the word to build. He, woman was built. Man was formed, woman was built. Um, God's building of the rib from Adam's side into Eve is a picture of building the church and New Jerusalem with the unbroken life which flows out from Christ. Um, 
yeah, and there's a few other things. So that, that's just some of the things that I was just doing a little bit of research on it. There's a lot of stuff that happens in this garden that paradise is lost and the, we need the millennium to be a real millennium. We can't be amillennial or, or um, post-millennial, like we're already in it. There's this rain that must happen that w what was lost in the garden becomes restored in the millennium. Okay, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, yeah, people... People ask, why did God put that tree in there? You know, wouldn't it be so much simpler if we didn't have, you, know, you can eat of all the trees except for this one. You say, well, what if that, God didn't put that tree in there? And some people, you know, atheists and others accuse and say, well, you know, how, how nice is that of God? Um, I heard one Bible teacher put it like this. It is not, um, you can eat anything in the, it, it's like an example of you saying to your child, you can eat anything in the kitchen except for this cake. Right? It, that's not the right example. The right example is you can eat anything in this kitchen except for the bleach under the sink. That's what it was. Now that doesn't sound unloving, does it? That's, yeah, he's not just trying to keep away the good stuff, right? Hey, that's for mum and dad, right? No, it's bleach, it's poisonous, it's gonna kill you. And the day you eat of it, you shall die. And that's the analogy. God isn't just trying to mess with us. He doesn't make laws to restrict us in a, in a, for, for, for the sake of restricting us right? Um, the laws are protective. God's laws are protective. Why do we have road rules? Is it because we've got Nazis in the government that want to just make people do stuff? No, it's to protect people. Laws are there to protect people. God's laws are boundaries. They're to protect us. When we break those laws, there's natural, physical, emotional, financial, all kinds of consequences that come. So God gives us these laws and they protect us and preserve us. Um, here's the other thing about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree is like an off-ramp. God has this beautiful garden, this beautiful plan, this beautiful relationship. He's got the beasts in the garden to keep him busy. And uh, he's got, eventually he'll have a companion in, in woman. Um, but God's like, but my character doesn't force anyone to do anything, right? There's an off-ramp. If you want to push the button and get off, there's a tree there. If you want to go your own way, if you want to grab the forbidden fruit and do it your way, you can. I've got a tree there. Because forced love is indeed no love at all. We cannot show obedience and loyalty to God if there's no chance for disobedience or disloyalty. Do you understand that? That the very nature of love means we must have choice. In order to have choice, we must have both good and evil. So it's only a good and loving God that, that could... Uh, a good and loving God would have to have an off-ramp, right? We'd have to have a bad choice to make the good choice chosen freely. Does that make sense? If I make my wife love me, is that love? If she has no other choice but to love me, how valuable is that love to me? If she could do nothing but love me, if she was only created to, that she could love me, that wouldn't mean much. But when she could choose to love me or not love me, and she chooses to love me, that becomes of very, very high value. Can you see that? In order to have free will, choice, and genuine free love, we must have off-ramps. And God created the ultimate off-ramp in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, let's move on. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havala, where there is gold. Um, and the gold of that land is good. The delium and the onyx stone are there. There's those three precious metals. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush, which is Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hedekel, or we know it today as the Tigris. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the, is the Euphrates. So we know two of these rivers. We don't, the other two have got lost or the, or the waters have changed over time. But we know we, historically we have these, um, these two rivers on a map. You can find them today. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Again, God took the man and put him in the garden. I don't know what that would have looked like, you know, and picking him up and putting him down into the garden of Eden. God's got, it's like when you're playing with, um, I was going to say dolls, but I don't think I played with dolls. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, God's, yeah, he's got his garden. God was the first gardener, and then he gave man to be a gardener like him. You know how little boys always want to grow up to be their dad? 
So that, that's what uh, that's what God's done here. He was the first gardener. It's a it's probably the first occupation too, um, and God and God did it. It wasn't beneath Him to tend the garden, and then He He took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die." Where is Eve when God is saying this to Adam? <laughs> in his rib, yeah, he's not created yet. But when the serpent comes to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, she quotes it and says, no, no, he said we, we can eat any of the trees, but not that one. So Adam did a, a good job, didn't he? He taught his wife what the commands of God. And for us to do a good job, we need to teach our families the commands of God as well. Um, so the word Eden itself means delight. So the Garden of Eden was a garden of delights. It was a very real place. Like I said, two of those rivers exist today, the Euphrates and the Tigris. Um, yeah, in verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. So I imagine God would have brought them in pairs of male and female to him, and he named, named them all. Um, but along the way, he's like, he's probably seeing, you know, they all have their mates, but I don't have a mate that's comparable to me. And, he, and in the beast, there wasn't a mate that was comparable. So it says, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Adam had already been placed in relationship to God. As I said earlier, a relationship of obedience. He now had been put into a relationship of dominionship over the animals. But that was only two parts of the complete package. Man needs more than his God and his work. He needs companionship. You see, God putting us into perfect uh, relationship right from the beginning that's what God's doing it's uh you know he creates everything and then he fills it and he creates the waters and he fills it with fish he creates the heavens and he fills it with birds he creates his earth and this garden creates man and uh, and puts him in relationships right from the beginning by, by the end of chapter two he's in relationship with his God in relationship with his work and the animals and in relationship um, with with woman companionship human relationship um, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. So it's the first general anesthetic, an operation. Um, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, or he built woman from. And he brought her to the man. So it was Matthew Henry, the, uh, the Bible scholar, that said, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Isn't that a, a beautiful picture of you know God? Um, yeah, God taking it from the rib. We're equal, male and female are equal, different but equal. Um, and yet, and we already see these other things, the protective nature of man and, and, and the love there being near the heart. Okay. And Adam said, so this is the first thing he did when he comes, when he gets awake, um, he gets all poetic, you know. So for a long time, we've had romantic poems um, but, you know, between man and woman but that was instituted on the very day that woman appeared the very first words out of Adam's mouth is this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed It's interesting, the, um, I alluded to it earlier, that the, um, you know, 
4,000 years after this happened, you know, another man was pierced in his side, wasn't he? Where his rib would have been. Um, blood and water came out, the two sacraments of Christianity, you know, the, the blood and the, and the clean water that washes us. And from that, his bride was created and given life. Right? So just it, all the way back there in the garden, you know, the taking of the rib, and so that the bride can be created. We see the wound in the side of our Saviour uh, and the death that came from that wound produced the life of the bride. Some say that the deep sleep here was as, was as deep as death, that this is actually a picture when Adam went into deep sleep, he's actually either literally or figuratively dying, just as when Christ died, out of his side comes his bride. Right? So these, um, you know, these beautiful pictures in Scripture only God could could uh, integrate into the scriptures. So the first romantic poem created on the very day, on the, on the very first day, woman came into existence. Um, Adam now not only had a relationship with God of obedience and a relationship to the animals and earth of dominion, but now also a relationship with woman of companionship. Um, this is the passage that Jesus quotes in Matthew. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Here we have the biblical position on marriage. It's, it's not many men and one woman. It's not many women and one man. Right? So that excludes polyamory and polyandrony. Or I don't know all the names, but bigamy. I think that covers all of it. Um, it it's, it's, they leave and they cleave. It's a permanent joining. But the leaving has to come first. Right? So you must leave your parents home, be married first, and then you can cleave. You see, it talks, it, th so right there we have an answer, is fornication okay? No, you must leave first, cleave, and then you can cleave, right? Is polyamory or is uh, bigamy, multiple wives? No, it is one man, one woman. Is there multiple genders? No, there's one man and one woman, right? Is, uh, is uh, remarriage and, and divorce okay? No, it's inseparably joined. They are cleaved together. They are joined together uh, for, for all of this life. So this is where Christians get our, our position on marriage. This is true Genesis history of how God created. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what many, many millions of believers have believed. And only really now has that started to become very controversial, hasn't it? You start to hit these these areas, whether it's LGBT or whether it's transgender. Um, but look, we've always got to go back to what the Bible says, don't we? What did God say? What did Jesus say? Right? Because in the end, it's only the truth will set you free. So even these people that you know, so zealously wanting to shut everyone else up and promote their one view, it doesn't do them any good for us to shut up and let them promote their view. Because if we really care about people, transgender and um, LGBT, we'll tell them the truth because we want to see them set free too, right? It's only the truth that, you set, that will set us free. Okay, let's end on that. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for your words, Lord. We thank you for how amazing your creation is, Lord. Seeing the other week about how you created the, the sun, moon and stars and the earth and just your power, Lord. Um, and then the Lord getting that inner look here of how you created man, that you breathed your breath into us, Lord. Lord, that you made woman out of, out of man. You formed us and created us, Lord. And you put us in perfect relationship so we could have security, self-worth and significance. Lord, that we can be under our God. We can have work to do to fulfill us, but have companionship as well, Lord, in the other people that you put into our lives. So Lord, we just... We want to glorify you, Lord. We want to thank you and praise you that you are not only God, the creator, that you are the Lord God, the covenant God, who's near to us, who came for us and saved us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.